Hi, everyone. It's good to see you all today. I'm Caitlin, and I'm a member of the Young Adult Programs and Services team at the New York Public Library. Thank you to everyone tuning in today. I'm delighted to introduce our event, which is part of NYPL's Books for All campaign. Thanks to this campaign, anyone in the country can check out a digital copy of Each of Us a Desert using our Simply E app. So far, over 1,300 people in all 50 states have checked out Each of Us a Desert in the past two months. Stay tuned for future titles and events just like this one. Another element of our campaign is the Freedom to Read Writing Contest. Teens from all over the country are encouraged to submit essays exploring why books and the freedom to read matter to you. Find out more on our website, nypl.org backslash books for all. Our author today is the wonderful Marco Shiro, who is the award-winning author of the young adult books, Anger is a Gift, Each of Us a Desert, and Into the Light as well as their middle grade books, The Insiders, You Only Live Once, David Bravo, and Star Wars Hunters, Battle for the Arena. They are also the co-author with, with Rick Riordan of the number one New York Times bestseller and number one indie bestseller, The Sun and the Star, a Nico D'Angelo adventure. When not writing, they are trying to pet every dog in the world. Mark is based in Atlanta, Georgia. Mark will be in conversation today with two of NYPL's teen reading ambassadors who work at the library. Ella, Najwa, and Mark will be joined at the end by Susan, who is on the young adult team here at NYPL. Thank you all for being here today, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Ella. Hi, Mark. It's great to speak with you today. As Caitlin mentioned, I'm a teen reading ambassador at the library. Teen Reading Ambassadors work after school with kids between the ages of 6 to 12 on homework and enrichment activities. To get our conversation started, why don't you tell us a little bit about Each of Us Desert? Yes, well, thank you, uh, both of you, Ella and Anajwa. I'm so happy to be here and to be uh, talking with both of you and doing this event with one of my favorite organizations in the world, the New York Public Library. Um, so Each of Us a Desert is my second novel. It is a secondary fantasy book, uh, meaning that it is an entirely invented world, is not set on Earth, uh, which was a big challenge to write. It is about a young girl who has the magical ability to pull stories out of people's bodies, and she's told that she cannot leave her village because she must always be there to essentially cleanse everyone, or their god will take vengeance on them and burn the Earth all over again. So this is technically also sort of a post-apocalyptic world, but in a fantasy world. Uh, and then one day a stranger arrives in her village and sort of upends her whole understanding of herself and her magical powers. And she sets across the desert um, in order to find answers and maybe is joined by some interesting people and terrifying things. And uh, it's my little fantasy nightmare book. I'm very proud of it. Thank you for sharing that. One of the things that made your book so unique were the poems Sochio kept finding. They were like little jewels of hope that kept her moving forward when she felt helpless. And I believe there were around five of them in total. My favorite one so far is this world of ashes cannot contain me. There are no walls to stop me. I am free. What inspired you to write these poems and have them relate to the character so deeply? So the poems were not in the original drafts. The poems came about sort of as this book took uh, shape more as a fantasy novel. I wrote a lot of poetry as a teenager. A lot of it, a lot of it was also song lyrics because I wanted to be in a band. Um, and so that was sort of my way of writing through my own emotions was writing poetry that I, in hindsight, wasn't particularly good, but I don't, you know, that doesn't bother me that it wasn't what I wanted it to be. It was more what I needed. I needed this outlet to express myself. And so, you know, probably the second or third draft is when I came up with this idea that someone who needed self-expression like Sochio so much was, was drawn to these poems that she is finding on this journey across the desert. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, an interesting fact about them, too, is they were all written in Spanish first. I did not actually end up translating them into English until late in the copy editing stage when I had this idea to have them appear side by side in English and in Spanish. Uh, then that idea came from thinking of the book almost like a religious text. And I remember 
being in church in high school and having the English and Spanish Bibles where you have the language in each column. And so that was where that idea came from. But for me, it was it was very much that space of how poetry can be such a revealing act and can be such a vulnerable act. And I loved challenging myself both by writing them in Spanish first, but also finding a way to tie them into a story that as a whole, I felt was very poetic. I tend to write very cerebral, metaphorical stories. Um, and so the, the poetry just made sense to me. The earth is personified many times throughout the novel. For example, it shouts, guides, and sings to Sochil. As seen in these examples, the earth plays a big role in Sochil's story of finding herself. What effect were you hoping to achieve by incorporating the earth into the book? And is this a statement about the importance of valuing the earth today? I am going to explode. So I mentioned this before this started. I have never been asked about this. And I think it's one of the key parts of the book, but no, just no one has thought to ask me about this. So I am practically feral right now that I get to talk about this. So yes, you picked up on a huge thread throughout this. Part of it came from this idea of how literal and visceral her journey is across the desert and thinking very much in the line with fantasy of thinking of setting as a person and thinking of setting as a character, but I wanted to take it a, a step further. And so some of this is drawn on the tradition of magical realism, which was something that I discovered late in high school and especially and in college, you know, this whole grand tradition of storytelling where things happen that aren't necessarily explained, but they just are. Um, and that is a very, very simplified, you know, interpretation of what magical realism is. It is a very detailed move, uh, literature, um, yeah, literature movement. But so I, I thought of it in that way is that is here is a group of people who live in a world that is, it, it, as far as they understand it, entirely a desert. Part of that came from this very real act that this God did years and years and years and years prior to the start of the book of just torching the entire earth as this act of revenge for their it's pe there are people not believing in them and and behaving, so to speak. And so I loved thinking of how did all of these people survive? What are the things that they did to subsist and thrive in a place that seems so very unforgiving? So taking taking it from that space, they had to be in touch with the earth. They had to think about um how they're going to find water, how they're going to find food, how they're going to survive any of the weird, strange creatures that are out there. And so I wanted a universe where being connected to the earth was never really adversarial. It is just common sense. This is just how everyone behaves. But since this is technically also this idea of a post-apocalyptic world in the fantasy world, this is a thing I do. I, I mix, mix genres up constantly and don't really care where it sort of falls in as long as it's telling the story I want to. I loved also, there's a lot of people who read the book as almost um, like climate fiction. Like it is meant to be a commentary on what is happening in our world. And I, I, I'm not going to deny that some of that didn't seep into the storytelling, but I was thinking of it primarily of a, as a fantasy and thinking, how are these people connected to the land? How do they survive in a place that seems so horrible and terrible? Um, but it, I also think it's beautiful. I grew up in Riverside, California, very close to you know Palm Springs. I grew up in a very desert-like locale, especially temperature-wise. And I didn't see that a lot in fantasy. Uh, it's not often that you get a desert location for a fantasy setting. So that was also very deliberate. Um, but there's, I'm, I'm very much the person of, I have my intentions of what I put into the work, but it has been very cool. The rare occasion someone does pick up on this thread about the connection to the earth and how it relates to the story. It is fascinating seeing people sort of apply a reading about it being about, you know, the climate crisis we're going through. Uh, I don't know that it was ever intended as a direct commentary, but it I don't I definitely see 
the importance of it. So I wanted the character of the earth to be very, whatever this earth happens to be, there's no name for it or whatever, but the land was very, very important that all of these people are connected to it. And then also thinking of it as, as part of Sochil's journey and the and her journey with the poems and her journey north and her journey with a person. And it's also interesting, it's hard to talk about this because I don't want to spoil like where some of this goes, but yeah, uh, very much intentional in a lot of respects. And a lot of that also not came from my upbringing where I grew up, but also research. I did a lot of research for this book, more than any book I've ever written. And I spent... <laughs> I spent time doing a trip to the Sonoran Desert in Southern Arizona and getting heat exhaustion for the first time, which I don't recommend. Don't do that. It's a terrible idea. But I I know some of that very detailed description came from my experiences on this trip being at, you know, in the desert as the sun rose. There's a line in the book where I talk about how you can hear the sun rising in the desert. And it is a genuine thing is you can hear many of the creatures basically going to their hiding spaces. And you can also hear uh, there's a repeated motif of birdsong, of how important birdsong is. It comes just before the sunrise. Um, and so having that connection where these characters are very aware of those things because this is their life. You know, that was something that I, I was very proud that made it into the final drafts. Yeah, and heat exhaustion and all. I love how you incorporated like the importance of the earth in the book because I just think it, I really related to it and how I think that it's important today and all the time. Yeah. And that brings me to, so takes in people's stories, but ultimately she has to give them back to the earth. Was there ever a story in your life that you would not give up? Uh, well, it's interesting being a writer because I feel like that's my job is to actually ultimately give them up. But yes, for a long time, I, I'm very precious about a lot of things. I had a book come out earlier this year called Into the Light, which is probably the closest thing to a memoir or, you know, an autobiography that I'll ever actually write. And it dealt with a lot of my experience in it with a very deeply religious and insular upbringing and my experiences with my brush with conversion therapy, all these really upsetting, traumatic things that I went through. And I avoided writing about it for many, many years. I kept those stories close to my heart, in part because while I do enjoy being vulnerable in my fiction, that felt a little too personal. And so it, it took me a while. But there, I mean, even with this book, you know, Each of Us a Desert is is a very personal story, not just because of where I grew up but what this story means to me. I mean, the even the idea, this is going to sound very silly, the idea of where that Guadistas and their power came from comes from this very intense memory I had as a teenager. Uh, I converted to Catholicism when I was a teenager and I had to go through, you know, this whole sort of Sunday school practice. I actually it was more than Sunday. It was multiple days a week. I would have to go to learn in order to, to make this conversion. And I remember having, and I wasn't, okay, look, let me just say, I wasn't trying to be argumentative, but I remember having a conversation with the sisters who were teaching this class about, I couldn't wrap my head around the, the sacrament of confession. In particular, I remember asking one of the sisters, do priests go to therapy? And they were like, what? Why would, why would you ask that? And I'm like, well, if they're spending their time during the week hearing confession, which is the worst things that people do, that's a lot to take on as a person. Who do they talk to? And they're like, well, they just talk to God. And I was like, but also what about therapy? Like, is that a thing? Um, and so the importance of what they, you know, instilled in me was that you they couldn't tell anyone. And so when I was coming up with the idea of the Quentista, I was so enraptured with this idea of taking on people's stories, but never being able to share your own, to share what other people are saying. What must that burden feel like? Um, and so that's even that is something that I struggled with in my faith as a teenager. And it became, you know, ultimately a story. So I'm, I know that there are things I'm still holding on to that I haven't really talked about in fiction yet. And for me, my journey with writing is, you know, it'll, it has to be the right time. I have to feel like I have not only the skill as an author to be able to write it, but I need to have the right story. It has to fit the book in the way that I feel like is best to tell that story. Thank you so much for sharing. 
So let's shift to talk a little bit, bit more about your process as a creator. So every artist has a different process for how they create work. I'm interested to know, what challenges did you face while writing this book? And did you have an aha moment where you had it all figured out? Yes, unfortunately, the aha moment came so late into this process. Um, so I started writing each of us. Well, I came up with the idea. It was in 2016 when I had the idea. And it wasn't until about a year later, uh, after my fir I got my first book deal for Anger's Gift, that I started writing this book. The original version of this book was more of a horror novel and it didn't quite work. I, I remember having a conversation with my editor after I turned it in that it was like, I it basically it was like, I see what you're going for, but it's not hitting the mark. And we had this great conversation where she asked me, my, my editor at Tortine, Miriam Weinberg, what is it that you liked about writing this book? What are the parts of it that really ring and are resonant with you? And there was an early version of it where there, the, this journey across the desert always happened. And I knew in some way I really wanted to do a, a version of the quest, like the fantasy quest, but I kind of wanted to subvert expectations for it. Um, and it was rewriting that first draft into the second one is where essentially all of the different elements of the storytelling, uh, the cuentistas, the journey, the salvoesos, all of that stuff weirdly came together in that draft but the aha moment wasn't until I turned that in and then it was still like okay I like the story better but you're still not there with you know with Zoe's voice it doesn't there's something missing and the aha moment for me was I and I, I, was, I was still living in New York at the time and I was at a cafe somewhere near the Flatiron building in New York and I was sitting across my editor and trying to figure out what this was missing and then I remember Mid-sentence, I was like, Miriam, stop talking. The whole book is a prayer. And it just like, it was just like, that was the, the there was something missing from it. And that made everything fall into place. It, of course, made writing the book a million times harder. I had to rewrite the whole thing again because I came up with this framing device of this character is explaining to her God why she did what she did. So that is where the opening, I mean, I had the opening and the ending within minutes I knew what that opening line was. I knew what the end line was. And then I thought, well, how do I turn this story into something that starts here and ends here? That is where I also was like, okay, before I would reference the stories, but I wouldn't tell them on the page. And I was like, no, the reader needs to feel and experience these stories she's taking out of people's books. So all of that came, it was wild. I also rewrote that draft in like a month. Like it was, it when it was that thing of like, you know, I talked about in the last question, when, you, when it's right, it's right. It has to be the right story. And having that framing device of this entire book is one prayer, as absurd as that was, I was like, that's it. That's the things that's missing. It allowed me to give Zoe her voice so that it, the book always sounded like her. And so, yeah, I mean, <laughs> unfortunately, that is how I work. I tend to write really sort of disjointed, messy first drafts that are an attempt at the story, but it's not quite where my heart wants it to be. And almost everything I have written, it doesn't land the first time. And there's something in rewriting it where I'm like, this is the thing that's missing. Um, and so, you know, I can't recommend that as like a, what writing advice do you have? Write 700 drafts. Don't, don't do that. It's very time consuming. But for me, my first draft is always just, let me get the basic idea of the story onto the page and then I'll deal with it and I'll figure out what it, it's actually supposed to do. My favorite part of the writing process is also editing. I know a lot of writers don't like it, but for me, that's where I finally assemble the puzzle and the thing that I've always wanted to tell in my heart is now finally on the page. Um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I tend to be a very quick drafter, but very messy. And then I take multiple revisions to sort of pull it into place and I feel like this book sort of set, set the, the pattern for my life of how I was going to draft these very ambitious, very, you know, I don't know. Each of Us the Desert is a weird book, and I'm so glad it ended up so weird. Um, so, yeah, that's a little bit of how my process worked for this book and most of the other ones I've written since then. That must have been such a relief getting your vision to be on paper. It sounds oh, Yes, that... I love that you put, said relief though, because it was, once I had that idea, so many of the things I struggled with of this part feels slow, 
I don't know if I'm in Zoe's head enough. I don't know if it, the reader is going to understand. It just was like, wait, if she is just talking to her God, oh my God, what a amazing thing. Like this conversation. And then you as the reader are almost getting an experience you shouldn't get because prayer can be such an intimate, you know, and lonely thing. And so I loved the idea of you as the reader are going to get an insight into something no one else would. And so, yeah, relief. That is, I felt such relief of figuring this out. Okay. So, um, I remember the last time I saw you speak at the library in October, you said that growing up, you didn't see a lot of books that resonated with you or characters that you saw yourself in. So when did you realize that you wanted to take the books you saw as a child and take matters into your own hands? And also, what hope do teens get from reading your books? Oh, wow. Okay, well, I know the moment, I have a very concrete moment in high school. Uh, I was very lucky in that my high school freshman year uh, English teacher, Miss Alford, assigned us back to back. We read Bless Me Ultima by Rodolfo Anaya and then The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros. And up until that point, I had never read, and I don't mean this as an exaggeration, like literally never read a book where the main character was Latino at all. And then to get back to back, those two books, two very different books, one sort of magical realism, you know, you know, Coranderas and 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 the other one, this mo somewhat modern book told in vignettes. I had never read a vignette in my life. And this idea of almost like these short scenes slash stories could make up a book completely changed my whole life. I knew then that the struggle that I was having is I, I had been writing, I had written many short stories and, and books on my own, but they always, they never felt true to me. I never, I never thought it was something that I was actually going to do, even though that was my goal in life was to be a, you know, an author. I just worried. I was like, well, who's going to want to read any of my stories? And then getting those two, it was, it was that realization of, oh, I can do this because someone else like me has already done it. So a great example of how that ended up showing up is, is the idea of the stories that are in a novel. So you have this novel and you almost have these scenes, you know, any of the stories that Sochil takes and you actually get to read. The idea is they're basically like the vignettes in House of Mango Street. This idea that you get a slice of someone else's life in a greater novel, that's absolutely a reference to House of Mango Street. Um, and so... I knew then in high school, this is the thing I wanted to do. <laughs> I was, let me also be honest, it was the only thing I was like super good at. Like I got good grades and stuff, but like, I remember I, last year I did a school visit and a kid was like, well, if you woke up tomorrow and you couldn't write, what would you do for a career? And I had like a minute long panic attack because I was, I'm everything in my life has always been writing. So that was the moment, you know, high school that really solidified it. I was very lucky and that I had so many good librarians and, and, and teachers in high school who encouraged writing and encouraged me to pursue this that absolutely set me on my path. And so to answer your second question, you know, I've been, it's my publishing journey is coming up on seven years in January. Oh my God, that's a, wild to me. And during this journey from when I got my first book deal until today, I have had, you know, the privilege of getting to talk to a lot of young readers and a lot of young writers and relative to, you know, what I just, or related to what I just said, I had an experience um, in 2018 when Anger is a Gift came out. I did a school visit where this kid he shuffles up afterwards and I had a table a set up and I was signing books while the kids who were there, you know, and he plops down. I, do I have, it's, oh, oh yeah, the very thick paperback for Anger is a Gift. And he plops it down on the table and just says, this is the first book I've ever read. And I was like, mm, oh, okay. Like in my head, I was like, I don't know that I believe that. This is a big book. Like, why is this your first book? And his friends who were with him were like, no, he doesn't read. And I was like, what? And he's like, I just did, like, we were reading in class and then I couldn't put it down. And it's just like, so wild to me. And then he pauses and he goes, I didn't know people like us got to write. And it was a lot. I started immediately tearing up and was, cause like, what a, 
immense, huge thing to hear from someone, especially like you said, you know, I had that event um, in, in the library last month. Oh, I can't believe that was last month. It was like 700 years ago. But to have that come back around and having been a kid in high school who finally felt seen and understood to then write something that then makes someone else see, it's wild. It's surreal. My, I can't tell kids what hope they might get out of their book, my books, but what I go into it is one, your stories matter, your feelings matter. I unfortunately, I had a lot, you know, I had a lot of great support from my teachers and librarians, but I didn't have support from my parents. And I didn't have a support from a lot of people in my life who one, couldn't see me as an artist, as a professional artist, like they didn't want me to go down that path. But also I think it's really unfortunate how often adults in our world just don't believe children and who don't listen to them and don't see them as people. And I want more than anything else that you feel like a person, a whole person whose thoughts and emotions matter when you read my books. You know, um, I think that's the most I can hope. Uh, anything else is, you know, extra frosting on the cupcake, so to speak. But that's my primary reason for writing is specifically for young people. It's why I haven't written an adult book yet, because I'm like, we don't we don't need it. We adults are boring. I don't, you know, I'd, I'd much rather write for younger people and hopefully inspire them um, in any, you know, I don't any way that comes about from reading one of my books. I think that's really, really beautiful because as an artist and an aspiring writer myself, I didn't really see myself represented in a lot of content like movies, books, or art growing up. And so I recently read this book called Love Radio by Ebony Liddell. And one of the main characters was a Guinean um, girl like me. So oh. I don't... Oh. I love Ebony. She's one of my favorite humans on the planet. I love her. Hi, hi Ebony. You're not going to see this, but anyway, hi, hello. So seeing the book with the Guinean girl that I, I felt really connected to, I don't think I've ever been so happy reading a book. And so seeing the change the past few years and authors like you bringing in diverse perspectives have been really, really inspiring. So thank you for that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think that creating stories other people can relate to is just like one of the best talents and just really important. So it's awesome. And the fr the theme of freedom is prevalent in this book, especially. And people give away their stories to Sochil in order to become free themselves. And in turn, Sochil becomes burdened with her job as a Quentista and begins to long for her own freedom. And as she begins to experience the desert, she finds herself and can finally say, soy libre for herself. Did you have any struggles with finding freedom in your own life that inspired you to write this aspect of the book? Yes. So this is the other question that I'm like really excited to answer because no one, I don't think anyone's ever really asked me about it. There is a metaphorical journey that is actually autobiographical in this book. And so much of this particular theme, this idea of her fe feeling burdened and feeling free came from my own upbringing. Um, you know, and I mentioned earlier having a very religious upbringing. And one of the things that happened um, is, and it's it's interesting because this part didn't make it into e each of us a desert, but is in into the light. It's the thing I didn't want to write about. Um, when I, you know, unfortunately, when I was sixteen years old, I got kicked out of my house um, for being gay, amongst many other things. And one of the most stark things that I recall of that period of my life, from sixteen to eighteen in particular, was one getting out of this very closed, very insular, very repressed environment and having freedom for the first time and not knowing what to do with it, in particular, feeling a lot of resentment of no one prepared me to go out into the world. And so if you look at each of us, a desert as a whole, the first I don't know, quarter of it is you get a sense of how restricted Sochil's life is. And then she leaves and her journey for the remainder of the book is essentially her going, oh, I don't know anything about the world. I don't know how anything works. And so a lot of, uh, certainly a lot of her early conflicts um, 
with Amelia, with the people that she meets, is actually her being very dogmatic about this is not how the world works. This is not how Guantistas works. This is not how magic works. You're all wrong. And her slowly realizing like, oh, because I was raised this particular way, I was sent out into the world closed minded. And so a lot of what her where her freedom comes from is being open minded and realizing the world is a million times more complex than she thinks it is. People can express their religious beliefs in a different way than her, and it doesn't make them bad people or evil people, even though there are some very bad and evil people in this book. But I I, I saw her journey as her leaving and with freedom comes complication and with freedom comes nuance. She gets to the end of this book and is like, oh, the world is so different than I thought it was. And it's not black and white. It's actually mostly gray and mostly in these weird middle spaces. And she gets to experience so much about morality and her own ethics and traveling and what migratory behavior looks like in her community and all these communities around her. And I just love this idea that freedom also meant that it just was her eyes opening and just getting the chance to see the world for what it is. And the world is beautiful, which very much influences her choice at the end of the book, which I won't say anything about. But yeah, that is all very intentional. And I talk about this too when I when people ask, how do you not only come up with stories, but you know, a lot of young writers ask, like, how do you write about yourself? Does it always have to be directly autobiographical? And I think each of us, the desert is a great way or a great example where I'm like so much of this book actually is not like I don't have a magical ability I have never walked across the desert for a week and a half like none of these things have actually happened and yet the book still feels personal I'm drawing on this emotional well in order to tell a story now in a very very different way so that that is where this sort of theme of freedom and then what freedom actually means that's where it came from Thank you, Mark, for that. That was um, a really nuanced answer. I really appreciate how much the book lived in the great area. I think it's so easy to make a villain, a villain, a hero in a book, and the fact that you know a person can be good and bad, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily one or the other. That yeah. you know, all it takes is just a lot of growth. And so, you know, what made you decide to really focus on that and not? I mean. Technically, maybe there was one true villain, right? Even, even as you were saying that, and I was thinking about it, I'm like, there's an antagonist, but there... Mm -hmm. it, it's also interesting because I feel like until maybe The Insiders, my first middle grade book, I'd never written a book with an antagonist who's there the whole time. Because I really love the idea that life is rarely a single antagonist it's rarely one person i get why especially in you know western storytelling we often hinge on protagonist antagonist and they it is a struggle for the whole book but in thinking of this book so differently both in structure in the framing device of like i don't want to tell a story the way western storytelling happens i mean technically the structure of this book is a circle in a weird way um i was like okay i don't think there should be a very distinct antagonist for the entire time. I loved the idea of pulling back and, and seeing this as a story of self-expression and growth and how sometimes the antagonist is inside of us, uh, which is a cheesy way to say, it, but uh, I, I, I know so much of what I struggled with as a teenager, yes, was external forms of antagonism, but it was also that thing of, you know, when you're 14, 15, 16, 17, what a rough and weird and volatile time. And so, so, so much of that came out of thinking of this as this is a young adult novel. What is something that I can do in this that maybe doesn't make sense for an adult novel or doesn't make sense for a middle grade novel? And it is taking this idea of the fantasy journey, the quest, the antagonist, but looking at it through it all at the lens of a coming of age book. And so there are that's a thing I do where I'm like, let me combine 700 genres in one thing. I do see this as a, a, a very short coming of age. I mean, the whole book takes place in like two weeks, I think, 
we actually wrote a timeline. I don't have to look at, I think it's less than two weeks, but I still feel like the journey is epic enough that it does feel like, you know, sort of the very traditional coming of age stories, but it's told through the lens of fantasy and post-apocalyptic and whatnot. Um, and so that's where that, that sense of like, okay, let's explore villainry in a very different way than you might expect in a fantasy book. Um, and yeah, it's, I'm, I don't know, I'm really proud of this book. <laughs> We're also really, really proud of you for writing this book. And we appreciate that it is out in, in the world for all of us. And, you know, speaking of circles, I really want to go back to that question about the earth and that symbiotic relationship we have, you know, um, the way that the earth changes us and shape us who we, who we are as people, but also the way that we change the earth and how yeah. we shape it to be who we are. And that changes as we move from place to place. And I really want to hear so much more about your trip to the Sonoran Desert. Yes. Oh and my like, God. Where, when did you decide to do that? Was that in the middle of the book? How long were you there? How did that sort of change or really strengthen the way that you were proceeding with the rest of your plot? I just want you to know that this, this is like, you've made me so unhinged right now. I'm so excited because I, again, this is the thing I don't often get to talk about because a lot of the stuff, also the answer to this is like in super spoilery territory, but I will, I will try not to spoil. I will say, so first of all, it was before I started drafting. I had a vague-ish outline, but I was like, I, I, I was at a point where, um, and maybe creative people, if you're, if you're, you know, watching this and curious, it was where I knew I didn't know enough where I, I had a grasp of like what it was like to grow up in a desert community or desert adjacent. Riverside is like not quite in the desert, but so I had some of that, but then knowing that this was going to be a long journey across the desert, I was like, I don't know if I know what I'm talking about. So I started with books and I read, there's a lot, there's some list of books in, I believe maybe the acknowledgements. I mentioned some of that. Um, I have written uh, a few essays and put some stuff online about excuse me, some of the books that I read. But, uh, so two cool things I'm going to tell you that made its way in. Um, so I read the books. I'm like, oh, this is great, but I think I want to go a step further. And I'd never done in-person research like this. I'd gone to libraries. I'd interviewed people for into, for uh, each of us, uh, excuse me, for Anger is a Gift. Uh, but I got this idea of like, let me go to, I wanted to go to a remote desert within reason. And so I knew I had traveled to Arizona many times growing up in, in California, but I knew particularly the Sonoran Desert, like below Tucson, was extremely, extremely desolate. There are very few towns. So I got this, we I stayed in the weirdest little cabin in, uh, where was it? Ajo, A-J-O, which basically means garlic. Um, and I don't know why that this little town is named that. And then it, from there, it was still another half hour drive out into the desert um, to Cabeza Prieta National Monument. Um, and so I would spend hours, uh, I went with my partner at the time, and we would spend hours upon hours without ever seeing another person. And so much of the silence and this, um, this sense of like, you have to listen and you have to pay attention in order to survive came from that trip because um, until you were in a place with so few people, you know, as someone who's been in big cities for most of my life, it is a very bizarre experience. So a lot of that came from that, but I will say one thing that came from reading the books that I don't often get to talk about because it's a real thing. Uh, there is a scene in the last half, maybe like the last third of the book where Zoe and Amelia come across a sort of makeshift community underneath a wall. Um, and I won't say much about it, except to say that that is based on a genuine community of children near the Rio Grande between in the border between Mexico and the United States who were actually found in the 90s. Like, it's a, I remember reading this being like, what? And it was generally people who were immigrating from the, or f often fleeing from Central America to the United States would leave their children behind to get a job, to come get them back. But they, uh, things would happen and no one would come back for these children. And these kids had their whole, this whole society built underneath the border. And I was like, 
what? Like how, like, and so it's that thing where, you know, truth is often stranger than fiction. And so a version of that, you'll get to it, appears in the book. Um, and so it, it's, a, a th- it just felt so on the nose for the theme of the book and the journey. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't know that I would love to have another project that I do that requires that amount of research, but I haven't yet. Um, but I loved it. I loved getting to learn more about the world and then using that to create art. And now I see why so many authors like talk about research and, you know, that was, so that was very new to, very, very new to me, but I think it, I think it makes the world more visceral. And I feel like that was why I was able to tap in so much into what Zoe's headspace was as she traveled across the desert. Wow. Do you happen to know the name of the community? Um, I would if I had time. A, it's in, I don't, I, there, is, I'm going to just show you, there is a falling pile of books on the floor of there because uh, I ran out of space. It is somewhere behind that because mm-hmm. my research books are on the bottom shelf, but uh, I, I will tweet it or email it to you to actually give you the name because I do have it somewhere in one of the books. I have a post-it note because um, I'm, I'm a post-it note researcher where I just put a bunch of little notes um, when I'm, when I'm doing research for books. Amazing. I mean, as a librarian, you know how much we love research. Yes. I I love that you added this sort of little tidbits into your book to make it so much more rich and nuanced and bringing in actual history. Yeah. Right. Again, you know, talking about the earth, talking about nature, talking about, you know, these folks and these young children who are able to fend for themselves, you know, and you talked about, you know, you didn't have a lot of support from um, your family as you're becoming an author because, you know, authors don't, adults don't necessarily believe children because we don't see them as people. And yet these children are fully realized because they're on their own. Yeah. And so what would you say to um, to teens who are really looking to become an author or any sort of content creator? Yeah. You know, that you know, um, as they're starting out and they're not getting that support that they need and that, you know, and, and that they deserve. I I very much, it's, it's interesting talking about it too, because before my father passed away in 2006, we actually had a wonderful conversation where he finally realized the writing thing was in a phase where he was like, wait a second, you're about to turn 23 and you're still doing the things we thought you would give up by the time you got to college. And I remember that being a big, big element that won him over of like, oh, this isn't a phase. So part of what I tell young people is it is it is unfortunate that you may meet people who won't support you. But I what I did was surround myself with the people who did. Uh, I was very again, I mentioned the the English teachers, the librarians that I had growing up who were very instrumental in who I am as a writer. But then as I got to college, it was finding creative people and not always writers like they were in different mediums or, you know, using different forms to express themselves. And being around an artistic community is life changing. I now, you know, now I live in Atlanta and I have a large friend group of writers here. We often write with each other in different places and being around other artists helps kill a lot of that doubt and that imposter syndrome that comes with being an artist because you're like, wait, they're doing it and I'm doing it. And also you can talk when you get to the frustrating points where you feel like maybe you don't have support or you feel like you're not doing the right thing or you're not sure about your art, you have someone you can talk to. I know that a lot of what makes it hard being a creative is the loneliness that comes with it. So a very big thing I tell anyone, but especially young people, is to find your community. Who are the people who support you, but also who are the people who understand you, either because they do art, because they consume art, they get why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, The other big piece of advice that I have, despite that it's embarrassing, is to not get rid of the art you are doing now. Um... Oh my God, I, okay, I have to go get something. It'll take me one second. I have the books that I wrote when I was in elementary school. Like I just recently got, hold on. I got to show you this, hold on. Folks, we are looking at Young Mark's art. Okay, okay. 
Okay, I'm coming back. I'm coming. So I wrote this. I was nine years old. I'm uh, no. Well, I wrote this one when I was ten. So this is on construction paper, laminated. That my four, what was I? Fourth grade, fourth or fifth grade teacher helped me make. Um, I was super into the Goosebumps books, and she encouraged me to create my own series. So it's called Terrifying Tale of Margaret Cheryl, and it is literally like printed out. These are the different chapters. Like, it's a whole book. Is this good? No, not really. But for someone who's 10, it's amazing. I learned plotting, how do chapters work? Where do you end a chapter? But the thing that's interesting about this is not only is it practice, all writing that you do is practice, but when I was 18, 19 years old, I did actually attempt my first novel. I wrote this book. Um, it was about a queer kid who finds a magical portal into their closet to this magical realm. Um, to help them find like missing ancestors or something. And again, I didn't really know what I was doing. It wasn't the best, but that book turned into The Insiders and You Only Live Once, David Bravo. I kept that draft all these years. And then as an adult, 50, almost 15 years later, I was like, wait, there's a good idea in this. Now I know how to do it. So I always say, I know it, it like, I look, like, I, this is so terribly drawn. What I don't even know what this is anyway it's badly drawn some of the writing is not great but i can look at it later as you've gained more knowledge as an artist and be like wait i know what i can do with these ideas um and so i you know i have a note a, a, a pinned note in my notes app that's all the ideas i have some of them are not great but I go through that whenever I'm starting a new project and I'll go through old drafts of things to be like, hey, this story you attempted or this novel you attempted, maybe now I know what to do with it. So that's another big one. I, I you know, yes, it's cringy to look back on some of the stuff that you wrote or drew or sang or composed or whatever, but they can be building blocks to creating a thing now. And just for me, it's just my, you know, I look at this, this wonderful thing and I'm like, look where it ended up. Like, look where, what, this is amazing. What I always wanted was to have a book with my name on the cover. Now I have seven of them with many more to come. Um, so yeah, definitely hold on to the stuff that you're doing now. Uh, it'll be, it'll be worth it in the future. I love that advice. I think it's so great. I love that you call it building blocks because they truly are building blocks that you can, uh, you can look back to and be like, wow, I really did that when I was 10. Yes, like, like yes, it really says like 1993 on that. That's so wild to me. Yeah. Yeah, 10 years old and amazing. Amazing, truly. I don't think I've kept anything since I was 10. Maybe some artwork. My art has not progressed very far since I was 10. Yeah, but, my you know physical art, like drawing, painting, any of that stuff all looks exactly the same. But the writing, <laughs> like even going through, I will say like when I went through and read this, I was like, oh, actually, that was a pretty good plot twist. Like, how did you think of that? Oh, that's so smart. Oh, like, so even then having that validation of like, you didn't know what you were doing, but you knew what you were doing. And you were uh, trying to emulate these things that you know like the goosebumps books the twilight zone i was watching mm -hmm. the x-files as it was airing this idea of like oh i like spooky things and i like shocks and twists and turns and character stuff like all of that was just sort of percolating in my brain and then as i've gotten older and attempted to write more it's i'm still like you it's the building blocks those same things that i love i'm now figuring out new ways to do them and new ways to enact them and enable them and it's still it honestly is still just as exciting as it was 20 years ago. Oh, no, that was 30 years ago. Oh, I don't like that. Anyway, ter terrible passage. What is age? It's concept. Yes. Yeah, I, you know, I love that. There's no right way to really, you know, begin your journey, but it is to just write it all down and let it flow. Okay. You know, there's no such thing as a bad idea. Just getting it out there and being able to go back and look at it and That's looking cool. at it with fresh eyes as you continue to experience the world around you. Uh, I agree. Okay. I have two more questions. Okay. Um, the first one, you know, in your book, there are tons and tons of great point of views and they're both so rich and their voices are so distinct and, you know, they, they align with one another. They eventually come together at the end. How was, how were you able to do that? What is that writing process like to keep all those different voices in your head? 
Okay, index cards, best friend. Anytime I attempt an elaborate um, sort of uh, structure of a book, so that includes this one, it includes Into the Light. I had to use index cards because that's a non-linear, fully non-linear book. Uh, index cards to just literally keep track of it. And so for this one, I had to map out two things at the same time. Or, oh no, now I'm thinking about it, three things. So I would use index cards of where Zoe's on her journey, where the poems are, and then whose story she's taken and in what order do they happen so that they thematically can tie into one another. Um, and so what the ter- oh God, it was, it was very, I remember uh, there was definitely a point, I think early, early 2020 when I was doing copy edits on this book where I was like, why, can't, why did you do this, Mark? Like, Because like my, even then my copy editor was like, okay, we have to make sure this appears here and this appears at this time and this. And I, so I, I remember on my wall, I had this just little pin board and it just had the journey on it so that I had some visual thing that I can look at. Uh, I will sometimes do visual outlines. There's this wonderful app called Scapple, S-C-A-P-P-L-E, where you can do visual outlines that I have used for other novels since then to give me that visual element so I don't get confused. Um, And so it's a combination of that. um, And then also I'm a big outliner. Outlines save my life. Every book I've ever written starts as an outline because I want that bird's eye view of the novel to get a sense of, you know, what I think of it as a roadmap. This is my, you know, my Google Maps directions. How do I get to from this place to this place? Here's all the twists and turns and the exits. Um, that being said, sometimes I'm writing the draft and I get to a point and I'm like, oh, wait, this place is actually way more interesting over here. So I do have the flexibility of like an outline can change if I discover something is important. But for me, that's part of the storytelling process is I want to know the beginning. I need to know how the middle looks generally. And I absolutely 100% need to know the ending. Um, I actually, fun fact, I write my last lines first uh, in all of my books. Uh, it is very interesting because even without the prayer thing, the very first draft of this book still had the same last sentence. And it, it, it's so wild that like even subconsciously I knew what this was about. But that's the thing of like, I, I'll know subconsciously what the seed or the heart of a story is, but it takes a, a hot minute to get there. I do wish it was a little quicker that I got there in one draft. That's only happened once in my once in my whole career have I ever got there the first time? Um, so we'll see. You got you got the rest of your years left to do it right, again, exactly. right? We're going for goat again. Exactly. I am a very. Um, I love that you. The last line has stayed the same. I am a very. Um, I need to write my first sentence first. It has to happen first before I can work on anything else. And that's just the way my brain works. And that's okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I write that second. Like that's, I need to know that too. Because the opening is really, I want the right tone, the right image. Like, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So this is my very last question. Our event wraps up with your book being available to anyone in the country who wants to read it for free. Can you talk about what that means in a time when a lot of books are being banned and access is restricted? I mean, as a lifelong, I can't even say fan, that's not even the right word, acolyte of libraries. I mean, the library is how I was able to read as a kid because we couldn't afford books. I think the only thing we could afford was Goosebumps books because they were really cheap. Um, So the library is how I read, uh, both the library at my school and the La Sierra branch of the Riverside Public Library where I grew up. I must have read hundreds upon thousands of books out of that specific library branch. And then libraries were very important to me when I was struggling with houselessness in in high school as a teenager. Then libraries became, uh, again, very important to me as I was like, I really want to write a novel and have a novel, novel published. It's where I did my research and whatnot. So on one level, like this is that full circle, thing, or at least it feels full circle to me to have a library like the New York Public Library, be so supportive of me and my work because libraries were supportive of me when I was, you know, it's like this beautiful thing 
um, to experience. And it's also a beautiful thing to experience because of how challenging it's been as an out queer, non-binary, non-binary Latinx author. Every one of my books has been challenged in some level or another. And um, I, I just, th- I know I would not be who I am today if I had not had the freedom to read. If I had not had fiction to explore myself, to explore my emotions, to explore the things that I had gone through and to find fiction. You know, people, this is a very real thing, but like fiction can be such a safe avenue to explore something you've already been through. Um, Because I often think about how that is a space where, you know, I talk about this with horror because a lot of kids ask me like, why do you write such scary, creepy things? And I'm like, for me, the genre of horror is controlled anxiety. I know it's not real and I know it can't actually hurt me. So there's a power in being able to explore the scary, the dark, you know, the unknown through fiction. And it's why I I love exploring that in my own books is because it's it's such a beautiful, safe space to do that. And so, I mean, that's what it means to me to have this kind of support to you know, give young people in particular the chance to explore very complicated questions about faith and migration and personal meaning and freedom and all these different things, you know that um, me and Ella and Anna and um, uh, oh my God, I've, is it not Najwa? Najwa, apologies for mispronouncing it. Najwa, like what we're talking about, like I. I feel lucky that I did get to have those kind of conversations in in high school, but not everyone gets to. Um, And so, you know, I'm very happy that the work that I do gets to be supported and I get to have these conversations time and time again with young people. I think we can all agree that, you know, young folks are the future and they deserve to see themselves in the books that they read. They deserve to see the experience that they lived and um, to be able to do so and to be able to have you as an author be held up in that light, right? And we're, we've been talking about full circles this entire conversation and, you know, it's almost like we've come full circle. Mm-hmm. And I want to thank you so, so much for this amazing conversation. I want to thank our teen reading ambassadors, Nanajwa and Ella for their great, great questions. Yes, wonderful and, questions. Yes, and thank you all so much for joining us today. Stay tuned for more author events and other books in the New York Public's library, Books for All Initiative. Thank you.